Let's you found this skeleton. How would you, how would you tell people that this is? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure it's not this. Welcome back YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. We are going to continue our discussion of this horrible Genesis apologetics video. When last we left off, we saw that Mr. Chadwick was willing to contradict his own data and those of his student Rose Summer Weeks when it's convenient and he doesn't think he'll get called out. Let's get back into it. Like there's some kind of flow taking place that's different from anything we have today. Today we have a basin, the sediments go into that basin from all sides, and we would see evidence of currents flowing into that basin. In the fossil record, what we see is the currents tend to ignore the basins. They tend to go right across the basins, and they tend to be looking at something much bigger than just a part of North America, for example. And in fact, the currents in North America and South America behave the same way, just to give you one example. Not according to your own data, Mr. Chadwick, or according to the data that Ms. Weeks presented to you, and to which you have raised no objection, as far as I can tell. So that, to me, suggests that in the development of the fossil record, we had processes going on that were bigger mm. than anything we can imagine mm. today. It doesn't say today's processes continued over a long period of time would have produced this. It says the only reasonable way to produce this is to have processes that are not going on on the Earth today. Except, as I've already pointed out in the previous video, link above, there actually is no dominant current flow that is unusual in any of the Mesozoic strata that you're talking about. It just doesn't exist. You're lying. And I know, because I know you know, because you collected the data. When you look at the rocks themselves, you don't see evidence for the passage of a lot of time. And Dr. Brandon and I have been working on this for the last 15 years, just going through tens of thousands of meters of sediment, looking for evidence of the passage of time between the layers. Mm -hmm. And the evidence would be that the layers have been disrupted or, or re-suspended re or moved around by organisms or roots or... Oh, so bioturbation. Like that paper by Weeks said was present in the formation you yourself dig in? The Lance Formation? Yeah, if you're not finding that, it's because you're not trying to. Bioturbation is common all through the Phanerozoic, as are in-situ roots, paleosols, soil horizons, you know all the things you'd expect if ordinary events are taking place over deep time. Or whatever processes. Once you deposit a layer, if it's just sitting there for a year, say nothing of a hundred years or a thousand years, mm -hmm. that layer is going to be affected by its environment. So in the current process today, if we have some sediment that gets laid down, what you're saying is that there are processes going on that would radically change that layer. Sure. Right? Roots penetrate its soil and move it around. Organisms, if it's, well, even above sea level, but below sea level you have worms that live all over the bottom and other organisms, and they're burrowing constantly in the, in the sediment. That's where they get their food. And so if you bring in a new supply of food for them, they're going to devour that, and they're going to mess up all the internal structure. So we look at these layers and we say, is the internal structure still there, or has it been disrupted by organisms, uh, which equals time. Not a lot of time necessarily, but time. Mm -hmm. If you see no disruption, then you're going to have a hard time explaining that sediment uh, in, a, in a long period of time. And what did you find down in the fossil We record? found tens of thousands of meters with no disruption whatsoever. Mm -hmm. One layer after layer after layer after layer. And we were looking at it in a centimeter scale. We were walking through thousands of meters of sediment, looking at centimeter level disruptions, and they're very difficult to find. You can find them once in a while, uh, but not the kind that we would expect if there'd been the passage of a lot of time. So we need bioturbation to be rare in the fossil record, and Mr. Chadwick says that it is vanishingly so. But the funny thing is that his own university, again Loma Linda, has published a paper on the taphonomy, extent, and intensity of bioturbation in the Moenkopi Formation of Utah. This is Taphonomy of Sediments, Bioturbation in the Triassic Moenkopi Formation in Southwestern Utah by James Vernon Bird, published April 2016, almost certainly before this interview. In it, Bird measured bioturbation levels throughout the entire vertical extent of the formation, and it is essentially omnipresent. 
only a tiny fraction of the formation can be determined to lack bioturbation. The only kind of rock in the whole formation without it is that formed by sandy clay. So from his own university, we know Chadwick is wrong. But even so, every time you hear about fossil trackways, which are common, that also defeats the idea of a flood. What I'm getting at is that Chadwick is either incompetent or he knows better. Doesn't it make perfect sense that these widespread mud, sand, and ash layers, which are filled with dinosaur bones, were deposited by a worldwide flood? At this point, the video puts in clips of some 18 or so documentaries about dinosaurs, in which the presenters talk about the dinosaurs in question being buried in water in general, or floods specifically. Since I have no contest with the idea that the majority of sedimentary rock is deposited by water, and neither does anyone else, I see no point to this. And since it took up about two and a half minutes of screen time, I'm not going to show it. You can see the original video if you want to see the montage for yourself. It's fascinating to see how many secular paleontologists admit that dinosaurs died in watery catastrophes. Uh, if by fascinating you mean completely ordinary and expected, then sure, because the existence of watery catastrophes, also note the use of the plurals both by this Genesis Apologetics guy and myself, are not unusual. They're not controversial. No one thinks they don't happen. This leading book that catalogs most of the largest bone beds in the world admits that most of them were laid down by watery catastrophes. Okay, but it also says a bunch of them were laid down by drought, almost as many as by flood. So, either they have garbage methodology, or this is no evidence at all for it. I mean, come on, you actually put up the graph, and it had a big old yellow chunk for drought. How does a group of animals die from a drought in a global flood? Seriously, I don't even need a source beyond this very video to debunk this point. Please do better, Genesis Apologetics. Oh, and as a side note, it also lists ashfall and predation. So, not exactly seeing how this pie chart helps. When looking at the largest of these dinosaur bone beds in Canada, secular scientists widely admit they were formed by dramatic high-speed water events. Yeah, but what about the ones that aren't? You're cherry-picking. Talk about the ones that were caused by drought. How do you square that with a flood? No one says that floods don't happen and that they didn't kill dinosaurs. You have to show that all fossils form that way simultaneously. Pointing out that animals were killed by a flood doesn't help you because no one says that doesn't happen. Let's not forget the most obvious clue about dinosaur extinction. They're all buried in sedimentary rock. There may be ash from volcanoes mixed in. No, just mixed in. We have subaerial ash deposits with fossils. Subaerial is just like subterranean or submarine. But where those mean underground or under the ocean, subaerial just means under the air. Or in more usual terms, in open air. Subaerial ash beds are not ash mixed with water. They're ash mixed with air, and we have fossils in them. But most dinosaur fossils have to be chiseled out of mud and sand layers. Many of these rock units laid down in a layer cake manner commonly span thousands of square miles. Yeah, because most sediment is laid down by water, but isn't from a flood. Interestingly, the illustration that was just up on screen showed the bones deposited in a graded bed, as we see in the Edmontosaurus bed in the Lance Formation. But as can be seen in the week's paper I keep referencing, that can't happen if the animals die directly in a flood. The bones would not be so finely graded. In fact, they would hardly be graded at all. The animals need to die, decay for a bit, and only then be swept up in a flood or mudslide. What's unique about the dinosaurs is that they are found in the very mud and sand that killed them, often twisted about and disarticulated. Except that no, we know that the more disarticulated the animal, the less likely the sediment around them is associated with the cause of death. I mean, just look at dead animals after a flood. They aren't ripped to shreds. Sure, you'll find a missing extremity here or there, and plenty of broken bones, but they aren't shredded. Floods aren't like industrial juicers tearing up bodies until nothing is left. How could an asteroid impact all the way down in Mexico deposit these extensive mud and sand layers that are hundreds of feet thick and stretch literally for thousands of miles? For the fifth time, it can't, it didn't, and no one thinks that. An asteroid would certainly create a crater on the Earth's surface with mud and sand layers thinning out from the crater, but the actual dinosaur bone layers in the American West remain about the same thickness for hundreds of miles. Right, because in the areas you're looking at, they were deposited over the course of about 130 million years, not in one event. It's your side who thinks that they were deposited in one event. No actual scientists say that all these layers are the result of a single event, including the Chicxulub event. And yes, I'll say it. You can't be a scientist in basically any field besides maybe like optics and be a young earth creationist. 
Because you need to be both honest and well-informed to be a scientist, and you can't be both while being a young Earth creationist. Noah's flood could do that, but an asteroid would not. Nope, neither could and neither did. The flood simply didn't happen, and just the mere existence of Mesozoic subaerial aeolian and evaporite deposits prove that conclusively, no matter what else you can say about the geological record. The Bible says that surging floodwaters took months to cover the entire globe. Okay, so let's read Genesis 7, 17 through 20. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went up on the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. I mean, forty days and forty nights is more than a month, but calling it months seems a little far-fetched. Saying months and not qualifying it says to me at least two, and probably more months. So we have just over one month of rising water, according to the narrative. Sure enough, dinosaurs are found in sequentially laid mud and sand layers all over the Earth. Deposition of these layers must have occurred quickly one after the other, because the upper surface of each layer is flat without erosion, indicating hardly any time passing before the next layer was laid on top of it by the next huge flood surge. Buried ancient landscapes are 100% a thing. We know of ancient valleys complete with strata and erosion channels that were infilled by sedimentation. So no, the layers are not just flat with no signs of erosion. That's simply false. The other challenge for the asteroid theory is that the Cretaceous fossils that cover multiple states in the middle of North America are at elevations hundreds of feet higher than the current ocean level could have placed them. Right, current ocean level changes. They're currently slowly rising. Even secular scientists explain that the only way to get these extensive fossils to their current elevation is through the massive flooding, followed by buckling of the continent. Nope, that paper you cited right there said sea transgression. A sea transgression happens when ocean levels rise and slowly water fills the low-lying parts of a continent. That's not a flood. A flood is a transient and usually high-energy event. Stop lying about things you're showing right on screen. You're debunking yourself. You're supposed to make me look stuff up, not just show that you're a blatant liar right on screen while you're talking. Earth's rapidly subducting crustal plates during Noah's flood would have compressed and buckled the sedimentary layers deposited on the plates by cycles of numerous tsunamis flooding across the land. Uh, no. <laughs> Those folded strata you showed were clearly defined rather than showing mixing between them. That means they had to have already lithified before folding. Lithification isn't a fast process. And once stone is lithified, it has to bend slowly or it will simply fracture. This simply cannot happen rapidly. Killing and burying dinosaurs mixed with marine life, as high as the elevations where we find them today. A profound challenge for the asteroid theory of dinosaur extinction is that a single asteroid does not produce such multiple continent-wide fossil-packed layers. Most dinosaur fossils are contained in layers of mud that were laid down in successive fashion, one after the other, as if by repeating very large amplitude tsunamis. Okay, this is for the young earth creationists out there. Let's say that I said that Christianity is stupid because Christianity is the belief that the proper way to worship God is by doing upside down jumping jacks. But since that's essentially impossible, Christianity is nonsense. You probably object by saying that Christianity says no such thing. You'd be right, it doesn't. So maybe stop strawmanning science and try to understand what it actually says. Further, tsunami deposits, both ancient and modern, are known in the geological record. Virtually none of the fossil record is contained in tsunami deposits. These layers are often hundreds of feet thick and laterally continuous for thousands of miles. As one would expect, yes. The well-developed catastrophic plate tectonics theory Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the did you just say? I'm sorry, do you mean the catastrophic plate tectonics theory that even AIG admits can't work without, quote, exotic solutions, without which the proposed geological activities would release an amount of heat that would boil the oceans many times over and leave the ark just so much carbon on a white-hot molten earth covered by a choking poisonous haze of greenhouse gases? Catastrophic plate tectonics makes Venus look like a trip to a ski resort. Oh, and that's again, according to Answers in Genesis, the creationists themselves know this can't work and isn't scientific, and so shouldn't at all be called a theory, except in the colloquial sense. Accounts for these features in terms of rapidly subducting plates that repeatedly lock and then unlock and slip, 
Each slip event unleashes a large amplitude tsunami. Wait, so this is happening while the waters aren't covering the Earth, according to your graphic. Which, granted, you probably got from the same mainstream documentary about seismology. But since you didn't clarify, it can only take what you have presented at face value. These rapidly subducting plates resulted in enormous volcanism that spewed megatons of ash that entombed countless dinosaurs in multiple states. The evidence for this is obvious. For example, the Independence Dyke Swarm is a system of linear fissures that erupted during the flood. This system extends over 370 miles in Southern California and belted out 4,000 cubic miles of ash that covered multiple states, leaving behind enormous ash deposits like the Brushy Basin Member, which is 110 meters thick in eastern Utah and found in 35 other locations around the region. Okay, so the model here is that the waters are rising, but apparently not yet at the elevation of the Morrison Formation. The Jurassic Supervolcano covers a bunch of dinosaurs in the Bushy Basin Member. Got it. So when that turns to rock, the kind of rock it should be is subaerial tuff. That being what subaerial tuff is, ash that falls out of the sky and turns to rock. Now we'll also say that maybe we could get some submarine tuff since the waters are rising at that point. Okay, so the bushy member basin must be made of tuff, whether subaerial, submarine, or maybe a mix. Quick check of the literature, and what do you know? It's lacustrine and fluvial sandstone and mudstone. Darn. Well, I guess that whole idea just got tossed out the window. By the way, lacustrine means formed in lakes, and fluvial means formed in rivers or streams. Now why might a creationist think that the bushy member basin was deposited by volcanic ash? The only thing I can find is that the sediments that were deposited were feldspathic. That is, that they were eroded bits of feldspar. Feldspar is igneous, and so I guess maybe you could make the leap from small bits of igneous rock to this must be ash. But that's not how it works at all. To be fair though, there are bits of ash in the member, but it is not even generally described as tuffaceous. Okay, well, I think that's where we're going to leave it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share the video. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Hovind, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, and Bob Knob. Their support helps make this channel possible, because as you may know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and they give this channel much needed additional stability. If you'd like to join the team, a link to my Patreon page can be found in the description, and you can join with the button right below this video on YouTube. Both groups of people get access to my special patron and member-only Discord channel, links to new videos before I release them to the public, as well as a pretty direct line to me. They also often are asked to do things like vote on new video topics. If a monthly subscription isn't something that you'd like to do but you'd still like to help out the channel, I also have a Teespring store that has Dapper Dino merch, including mugs, blankets, pillowcases, shirts, all sorts of things. And if none of those things are for you, then please just remember to like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and share the video. All of those things really do help the channel grow. Well, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. <laughs> How would you tell it's a dinosaur? You first, first, first. How would you tell it's a dinosaur? Well, if there's a question, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.